Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. Today's episode is going to be the start of a multi-part series, probably four parts, on The Great Leap Forward. If you were going to place a bet on a single event that had the most impact on China during the 20th century, it would probably be a toss-up between The Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And yes, I am also very aware that we are going from one mini-series on hugely important event to another mini-series on hugely important event without having any sort of mini-events happen in between, but I can explain this. So historians tend to do this thing where they talk or write about history as if it's a sequence of really interesting events that happen either to the entire of a society or just a few very important people. If you've ever taken a history class, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Back when I was in school, we went from the unification of Germany to the Boer War to World War I and then World War II as if these events not only linked to and explained one another, but as if that was all that had happened during that 60-year period. Of course, anyone who has lived life knows that bar the years 2020 and 2021, This isn't usually how things go. Most of life is pretty boring, straightforward, repetitive, with fun and memorable personal memories scattered throughout and the occasional world event happening every few years or so. I say all this to say that yes, as a historian making a historical podcast, I am to some extent skipping over the little things, the mundanities of everyday life, the small important occurrences and tidbits when I move from one episode to the next. However, I really wanted to stress that while I may not be stopping to talk about the everyday lives of Hunanese farmers in the 1950s, I really am not skipping over any other events of national significance, let alone international significance. When I tell you that Chinese history from 1911 to 1979 is just back-to-back, balls-to-the-wall action, and that something huge, important, ridiculous, or all of the above happens literally every single year, I am not exaggerating. If it ever seems like I'm just jumping from one massive thing to another massive event, it's because there were basically only massive events. To give some context, let's take the gap between World War I and World War II, which is about 21 years. And yes, while you can link these two events together, mainly by using hyperinflation and Hitler's personal biography as an anchor, which is what they do in schools, they are two distinct events. The gap between the anti-rightist campaign and the Great Leap Forward in China is probably less than 21 weeks. In fact, the gap is so small that you could probably argue that there was no gap at all. So, When I move from one ridiculously large world-ending event with a huge impact on the entire course of Chinese history to another one of those, I'm not skipping things and trying to create artificial links between them. I just don't want you to think that I'm glossing over entire periods or themes and that you're missing something. This is what happened, seriously. And it gets much worse when we get to the Cultural Revolution. Anyway. With all of that prelude out of the way, let's start with a brief overview of the Great Leap Forward itself. The Great Leap Forward, or China's second five-year plan, was Mao's grand design to launch China into modernity by using mass mobilisation techniques developed during the Yan'an years to rapidly advance the country's agricultural and industrial capabilities. It was formulated as an alternative to the slow and steady plans that China had adopted from the Soviet Union, which promoted moderate growth over the fast-paced jump in steel production that Mao envisaged for the nation. The plan, simply put, was to outpace developed Western nations such as the UK in major industrial production by the end of the five-year period, which was over time shortened to just two years as the zeal and fervour surrounding the campaign grew to a frenzy. Unfortunately, the reality fell far short of the plan. Not only did both agricultural and industrial production fall in real terms, standards of living dropped as light industry was sacrificed completely, inflation soared, and a combination of man-made factors and poor natural conditions led to one of the worst famines in recorded history. Over the next few episodes, we'll be exploring the Great Leap in its entirety, from top to bottom. How was the decision to launch the Leap made? How were people mobilised to participate in the campaign? 
How did it impact people's daily lives? And what were the social, economic and political outcomes of the policy, some of which academics still debate about to this day? We know that by the end of the leap, the leadership of the party was split, Mao had lost its prestige, and China was on the road to the Cultural Revolution. In order to understand the events of the 1960s fully, it's necessary to explore how the leap made China just vulnerable enough to succumb once again to Mao's tactics of mass politics just eight years later. So before we talk about the Great Leap Forward specifically, I just wanted to quickly talk about China's recent and long-term history with famines. And when I say recent, I mean in terms of before 1950. The fact that China was no stranger to famines is really important here. It helps explain a lot of the things that we'll be discussing in later episodes, such as why the realisation that something bad was happening took so long, why there was no national uprising at the way the government was handling things, and in general, why there was a famine at all. Now, I want to preface this by saying that by explaining that China had a long and difficult history with famine is in no way excusing the actions of the CCP or trying to shift blame away from the government when it comes to the Great Leap. First of all, technically speaking, every famine is the government's fault, as they are the ones responsible for the acquisition and distribution of food to their citizens, especially in a centrally planned economy like the one China had at the time. In fact, this was the traditional way of thinking in China, dating back millennia. If there was a famine, then it was both the emperor's fault, as he was the one who had failed to keep an eye on things, and also his responsibility to fix. If he failed to do so, then the peasantry was well within their rights to try and overthrow him, which is usually what happened if things got too bad, and then install a new emperor whose ancestors would end up making exactly the same mistakes 200 years later. Secondly, I'm not saying that China had a famine every weekend, so the people living through the leap should have just dealt with it. The majority of famines in China were not only localised, but also relatively short-lived. For example, There had been five major famines in different regions across China since the turn of the 20th century. There was the Great Qing Famine of 1907, which happened in northern Jiangsu province, in which approximately 25 million people passed away. There was the Northern China Famine of 1920 to 1921, in which approximately half a million people passed away. There was another famine in northern China, in which 3 million people passed away in 1928 to 1930. There was another famine in Sichuan and Gansu provinces in 1936 to 1937, in which approximately 5 million people passed away. And between 1942 and 1943, a famine in Henan led to roughly 2 to 3 million deaths. Now, all of these famines also have various main causes, things from natural occurrences like droughts to extenuating circumstances like World War II. So while certain people were familiar with famines, in fact, probably everyone in China knew what a famine was and had probably experienced some sort of food scarcity at some point in their lives, there had never really been a national famine, at least not since the Taiping Rebellion, which happened in the mid-19th century, which is obviously outside of living memory. So I'm not saying that the Great Leap Forward was not the CCP's fault as this particular disaster can be attributed directly to their policies and actions during the three years of the disaster. However, knowing China's history with famine and the causes of those famines is important because it gives context to what exactly the Great Leap Forward was trying to achieve in the first place and what problems with China's agricultural system the CCP was trying to fix. The fact that there were frequent famines in China was a known known, In fact, often when talking about the Great Leap in general, Mao and other people's speeches would frame the Great Leap as something that would combat famine and hunger in China for good. So if anything, famine was one of the motivating factors behind the Great Leap in the first place. Okay, so let's move on to how the Great Leap Forward was launched. So, whose decision was it? Well, you've probably guessed by now that Mao was the main architect of the scheme, But how he arrived at the decision and how he convinced everyone else in the leadership to go along with it does require some explanation. It seems that over the years, as more documentation from the mainland previously under lock and key has become available to researchers, opinion has shifted on who exactly the main actors were and what their roles were. Whereas in the 1980s, it seems that Mao was not so much the puppet master as he was the commander in chief, 
Most studies now argue that Mao cajoled and pressured his fellow leaders into going along with his plan under penalty of purging or worse. In November 1957, after the fervour of the anti-rightist campaign had died down somewhat, Mao had visited Moscow to join in the celebrations for the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. Despite relations between the two nations cooling since the release of Khrushchev's secret speech roasting Stalin's cult of personality, there were still deals to be done in terms of trade and defence, and in general the communist bloc was still standing in solidarity against the capitalist West for the time being. During his time there, Mao noted that the Soviets were planning on decentralising their economy in order to try and overtake the US production of meat, butter and milk by 1961, and important products such as iron ore, pig iron, steel, coal, petroleum, electricity, cement and consumer products by 1970. More importantly, Mao was intrigued by Khrushchev's determination to rely less on economic planning and statistics and instead use politics and mobilisation to achieve this goal. Khrushchev's own plan gave Mao both the encouragement and the sort of moral high ground to pursue his own plans for the fast-paced development that he envisaged. After Mao returned from Moscow, on the 2nd of December, Vice Chairman of the CCP, Liu Xiaoqi, gave a speech outlining Mao's plan to the All-China Federation of Trade Unions. He said, quote, in 15 years, the Soviet Union can catch up with and surpass the United States in the output of the most important industrial and agricultural products. In the same period of time, we ought to catch up with and surpass the United Kingdom in the output of iron, steel and other major industrial products. I'm not really sure why the USSR had to pick the USA, but China had to pick the United Kingdom. I know that the USSR and the USA had beef, but it doesn't really make sense why China had to go for the United Kingdom and couldn't also choose the USA's targets, but I don't know, that's never explained. That's just something that we have to live with and take to our graves, I guess. The idea was that within 15 years, China's steel output would be 40 million tonnes compared with the UK's current 20 million tonnes. China would also apparently be able to surpass the United Kingdom in the output of coal, metal cutting machine tools, cement and other chemical fertilisers within that same 15 year period. So basically just becoming a better place, I guess, with more steel buildings and more better fertilised vegetables. In order to gather data from people before launching the campaign at a national level, Mao and the other members of the Politburo, including Deng Xiaoping and Commerce Minister Chen Yun, who is important for today, so remember that, Chen Yun, all went on tours of the country, visiting provinces to gauge both the preparedness for the leap and also to look at the progress of other pilot schemes that they had put in place in smaller areas. Some of the important schemes that are mentioned include the Eliminate the Four Pests campaign, which encouraged ordinary citizens to fight infestations of sparrows, flies, mosquitoes and rats by improving hygiene and chasing down vermin wherever they were spotted. This public health campaign is important because it ended up having disastrous consequences later on because food chains and ecology, but we'll get onto that in a later episode. Other local campaigns included dam and irrigation works building, both of which would become major features of the Great Leap. At the time, the accomplishments of these experiments in labour mobilisation provided seemingly miraculous results. By January 1958, 100 million peasants had worked to open up 7.8 million hectares of arable land through irrigation works, almost as if to prove Mao's point that politics was a perfectly viable solution to economic problems. However, as we'll see later, such schemes would contribute to the ultimate disaster of the leap by depriving key areas of agriculture of thousands of workers. Some people were apparently able to see into the future and kind of predict this kind of problem arising. Mao's ideas were by no means endorsed by everyone. His most notable opponent was the head of the finance ministry, Li Shenlian, as well as the head of commerce, Chen Yun, and also the premier, Zhou Enlai. They were all notable conservative critics of Mao's economic adventurism, and from now on we're going to refer to them collectively as a group, and we're going to call them the planners, 
So Mao's main problem was with the finance ministry because he had accused them of trying to halt China's economic progress. But really, they were probably just trying to avoid repeat of the hyperinflation that had plagued China after the nationalists were kicked out of power. The problem stemmed both from the concept of risk and from each party's willingness to rely on professionals and intellectuals to work out a precise economic plan. While the planners and Mao all agreed that China's economy had become overly centralised, the two groups disagreed fundamentally about what to do about it. A major sticking point was agriculture. Although there had been around 3% growth in grain production over the course of the first five-year plan, this had been met by an increase in rural consumption, as well as an almost matched growth in population size. As China had always relied on an increase in labour output rather than an improvement in technology to raise production levels, Most planners agreed that a significant increase in output would not be possible without some sort of major investment in agricultural technologies, including fertilisers, machinery, and research into different crop varieties. But all of this number crunching and overthinking was just a big hassle to Mao, who, as noted in the previous episode, was getting pretty sick of intellectuals and all of their whining about how the party over-politicised everything, from culture to science and now economics, which was his new baby. He also disliked that the plans put forward by the bureaucrats in the finance and commerce ministries favoured policies like financial incentives and career progression, as opposed to just relying on people's revolutionary zeal to succeed. He got so frustrated with the finance ministry that he complained openly in a conference in January 1958 that for several years they had been sending documents that were so technical and complicated that he had to sign them without even reading them, which then undermined his own position in the economic planning process. Such a slight could not be allowed to continue. Mao also wasn't willing to divert precious resources away from heavy industry, which he saw as the backbone of China's modernisation and a necessary requirement for China to join the ranks of modernised developed nations. China could no longer rely on the Soviet Union's direct help, as they'd had to divert a lot of their own resources to the Eastern Bloc to stop the collapse of communism in Europe. Now, the planners' idea was to distribute resources equally between all sectors, agriculture, light industry and heavy industry, so that they could all grow in tandem and thus all support each other without one draining resources too much from the others. But years of disappointing industrial and agricultural growth during the first five-year plan, coupled with an embarrassment of the 100 flowers and anti-rightist movements, meant that things were already not going how Mao wanted, and so this move would have just been a further deviation from his dreams of becoming an industrialised nation, like a Western country, within five years. From Mao's perspective, what was needed wasn't more equality, but more revolution. According to Mao, peasants and rural cadres had fallen into a pattern of individualism, departmentalism, absolute egalitarianism and liberalism. In other words, they were more concerned with improving their standard of living than the overall aims of the revolution. Equality could wait. People were expected to sacrifice their own comforts for the sake of the nation as a whole. That's the spirit of socialist realism, after all. At the end of the day, anything short of miraculous growth threatened to undermine Mao's own position, which was not something that he was going to allow. Better to whip people up into a frenzy so that they're too busy focusing on implementing social and political policies to notice that the economy isn't performing exactly how the revolutionary vanguard said that it would. So, throughout late 1957, Mao made speeches and co-signed editorials in major national newspapers, such as the People's Daily, encouraging people to continue opposing rightism and conservatism and to embrace a leap forward, a phrase that was now coming into common usage. Mao's view was that everything had to be decentralised, not just the economy, but also culture, education and public health. These ideas were supported by central and regional leaders, such as Liu Xiaoqi, the ministers of agriculture, chemical industries and metallurgy, and the leaders of local areas such as Shanghai and Zhejiang. Over time, Mao would advocate the greater devolution of power to the provinces, claiming that they were more efficient at running their own affairs and knew what resources they had and how their people could be mobilised better than the central leadership. 
These local leaders ended up being the key to Mao's policy success, starkly opposed to central leadership who Mao regarded with increasing hostility as he tried to sell his plan for the leap. In a conference in Nanning in January 1958, he lambasted the planners group for throwing cold water on the Chinese people and consistently defying him with their go-slow policies, causing many of the planners to issue self-criticisms and for Zhou Enlai to question whether or not he should even be the premier anymore. In the end, they just stopped offering their opinions altogether, fearful of condemnation in the national press or political attacks by their peers. Mao's tactics of intimidation were winning. With opposition to his plan now successfully stifled, Mao was able to roll out the Great Leap blueprint across the country throughout 1958. The main elements of the plan focused on mobilising underutilised labour, particularly in the rural sectors, in order to feed everything into heavy industry, ignoring the so-called specialists where necessary in order to achieve more, faster, better, more economical results. Other key features of the plan included having multiple sets of targets, each higher than the last, one that was expected to be reached and the other which was also expected to be reached but with greater exertion. Uh, You also had the expectation of imbalance, a deliberate counteraction to the planner's wishes of all areas of the economy growing in tandem. And finally, another important feature was the definition of the Great Leap Forward in general as a continuation of the revolution. These grand designs were to be achieved by implementing probably the most important and memorable component of the Great Leap, the creation of the people's communes. Communes were formed by amalgamating higher level cooperatives into much larger units of around 2,000 to 20,000 households, depending on the area and population density, that allowed work and pay, as well as administering healthcare, childcare, education, food, consumer goods, and basically all forms of social life to be decided by that commune. Apart from achieving tangible benefits, communes were also promised to liberate women from the home eliminate the pesky patriarchy once and for all, and raise the overall efficiency of labour. Also, if it wasn't obvious already, communes also got rid of the idea of private ownership. Although the high-level cooperatives had required peasants to work together on a large scale, technically people still had rights to land that had been redistributed to them as part of the land reform movement that had taken place just in 1953. But to Mao and to the revolution, these private plots were nothing but the remnants of an evil capitalist system, as were the private rural markets, all of which would soon be replaced by a society working together in harmony to make sure everyone's personal needs were taken care of. The language surrounding communes, used to describe them, their functions and things like that, is often quite militaristic. For example, the subunits within them consisted of brigades and units. Workers from certain units were deployed to work on certain projects or fix certain problems within communes, making these communities entirely self-sufficient. This also allowed for labour to be deployed for much larger projects, such as dam building or canal digging, because you now had tens of thousands of workers at your beck and call, as opposed to just a few hundred. Food and other commodities were to be supplied freely based on need, eradicating the need for wages truly a communist utopia, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, if you will. Certain aspects of communes were initially a big hit, especially the mess halls where peasants could eat their fill of commune food without having to pay. This was probably helped by the bumper harvest of 1958, which put further wind in the sails of the communization plan. By December 1958, rural leadership had gone full steam ahead, setting up around 26,000 communes that incorporated 120 million rural households, or around 99% of the peasant population. Suddenly, problems that had plagued China for millennia, overpopulation, starvation, labour shortages, were all a thing of the past. As if by a miracle, the production figures reported by rural cadres ballooned, proving that the power of collective work could overcome any problem, from rabid individualism to technological backwardness. I say as if by miracle, because it would have been miraculous if such feats were achieved in just a matter of months, and the problems of agricultural production and food shortages that the CCP had been trying to solve for decades just disappeared overnight. 
The reality was quite different, however. The reported numbers of 375 million tonnes of grain was later revised down to 250 million tonnes, as it was revealed that many cadres had taken to over-reporting figures due to fears of being labelled a rightist, and those who may have been brave enough to report discrepancies in the numbers had seemingly disappeared over the course of 1957. See, this is why we had to spend three episodes talking about Mao's hang-ups with intellectuals. By early 1959, the cracks were already beginning to show. Reports reached the centre of harsh treatment of peasants, who were often overworked without rest or compensation, in order to help pressured cadres fulfil sky-high targets. There was frequent misappropriation of livestock, tools and raw materials between different brigades, with larger administrative units often taking what they needed for big projects from smaller counties or townships without remuneration or any promise of return of goods. There were also cases of strict and harsh enforcement of the collective aspects of the campaign, as houses were repossessed and even abolished, grain requisitioned for central redistribution, funds siphoned off by corrupt officials, and grain concealed by peasants suspicious that the free food wouldn't last for very long. And they were right. By the autumn of 1958, all the grain from the harvest of that summer had been consumed, and the amount and quality of food in the mess halls was worsening, causing discontentment among the peasantry. Many communes decided to scale back, returning to collectives and letting some of the peasants farm their own private plots again. What should have been a smooth transition from socialism to full communism had been marred by chaos. By the end of 1958, even Mao admitted that the excesses of the Great Leap had to be reined in, even allowing certain members of the planners to help adjust certain targets and to make the leap more achievable. So, here we are, in early 1959, and you're thinking, okay, mistakes were made. Obviously, this whole Great Leap thing was a little bit hasty, but there's still time to stop it and implement a more moderate replacement plan that the finance ministry can sort out. Unfortunately, the point of no return was crossed in 1959, when Mao finally cracked down on all dissenting voices and opinions, and finally asserted total dominance and control over the Great Leap Forward and China's economy and politics as a whole. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, that was sudden, what happened? Well, different academics give different interpretations about the extent of Mao's dominance of political decision-making during this period. While some argue that it was actually different bureaucracies and factions vying for power, each seeking Mao's support and approval for their plans, others push the idea that Mao actively sought allies in his fellow leaders and was frequently and openly questioned by other leading party members in the oppose the hasty advance, we want more planning group. However, the prevailing opinion now seems to be that Mao, in fact, was running the show the whole time and would brook absolutely no opposition and had his colleagues cowering in fear at the very mention of the word rightist. Now, these sorts of debates between academics come across as a little nitpicky, and not that important in the grand scheme of things. At the end of the day, the Great Leap happened anyway, regardless of who agreed with it at the time and who didn't. No one did anything to actively try and stop it taking place. Except for one person. And that person is the tragic figure of... Peng Dehuai. Now, I use the word tragic here retrospectively, as at the time, there was nothing meek, shy, or retreating about Marshal Peng. Former poor peasant turned China's defence minister, Peng was a hardened communist veteran, having led his men to victory during the Long March, the Civil War, and the Korean War. Accounts of Peng Dehuai seem to indicate that he feared very little, and in general was more than willing to stand up to his superiors. Apparently, at one meeting with a Soviet delegation to China in 1956, Peng asked Deputy Prime Minister of the Soviet Union, Anastas Mikoyan, why they were only now criticising Stalin. When Mikoyan replied, we did not dare advance our opinions at the time, to have done so would have meant death, Peng simply replied, what kind of communist is it that fears death? It was exactly this kind of attitude that would get him in trouble during the Lu Shan conference to discuss changes to the Great Leap Forward, which was held in July 1959. Before we get to the Lu Shan conference, it's probably worth noting that a few months earlier, 
Mao had actually stepped down as head of state, passing the title on to the younger and more level-headed Liu Xiaoqi. However, Mao did retain his titles of chairman of the CCP and head of the military. This move should have given Liu some considerable control over economic affairs, and this seemed to be the direction that things were headed in at first, as he was taking an active role in replanning China's future, and Mao in this time took some vacation time, I guess, to visit his hometown in Hunan province in June. So after Mao comes back from his holiday, they have the Lushan conference in July 1959. At the beginning of the conference, things seemed to be going the way of the more cautious planners. Mao admitted that the leap had taken on too many excesses, and argued that there should be greater balance and realism when trying to achieve production targets. Apparently the words, we prefer to produce less but of better quality and greater variety, actually passed his lips. All was peace and harmony until suddenly it wasn't. It all began when Peng started airing his criticisms at small private meetings of top leadership during the conference. Now, at first, his comments seemed to be in line with the general consensus at the time, and he seemed happy to be able to speak his mind, despite not actually being an expert in agricultural affairs. Perhaps some of his comments came across as a little bit brash, but nothing he said was particularly out of line, especially considering what everyone else was saying. Peng himself had visited the historically impoverished province of Gansu during 1958 just to see how the Great Leap Forward was going. He was excited to see how much progress the province he had personally liberated from the nationalists back in 1949 had made, and was at first impressed by the backyard steel furnaces he saw littering the countryside. But when he inquired about a pile of ripe crops lying on the ground unattended, An older peasant explained that all the young, able-bodied workers had been deployed elsewhere, and there weren't enough people to help with the harvest. After he visited several other provinces, he also became disillusioned with the backyard furnaces when he realised that people's homes were being destroyed in order to fuel them, and those in other professions, such as child carers and teachers, were being pulled away from their duties in order to run them. To Peng Dehuai, it seemed clear that the exaggerations of the elite had not yet been properly reined in, as he saw peasants frequently on the brink of starvation, run ragged by a militarised lifestyle, while cadres happily continued to report bumper harvests. Now, this whole time, Peng just reported on what he'd seen. In response to the idea that the chairman knew better than anyone else what was going on in the countryside, Peng stated that Mao may not have fully understood the situation as just by visiting his hometown, he didn't really realise that his home may have been receiving more state aid than he realised. He initially received little backlash with this comment, and things seemed to be just fine, but everything changed with the fated letter, sent privately from Peng Dehuai to Mao on July 14th, around halfway through the conference. The letter itself, which I've read, is quite inoffensive, Peng goes out of his way to praise many of the achievements of the Great Leap, including the large-scale works that will definitely go on to yield future results, the fact that the communes will eventually allow peasants to free themselves from poverty, and that, in general, there had been growth in the industrial and agricultural production. What he suggests is that careful planning needs to take place to ensure the excesses of the previous year do not occur again, and that every aspect of the leap be analysed and careful lessons drawn from experience so that the same mistakes are not repeated. He basically just asks that they follow the chairman's own words, to seek truth from facts. However, apparently this letter was the most egregious thing that Chairman Mao had ever received in his entire life, and it threw him into a complete fit of hysteria. He printed out the letter and circulated it to all senior cadres, which, considering that this was the 1950s, would probably have taken a considerable amount of time and energy. And then he used it to claim that Peng Dehuai was directly and personally attacking him, and accused Peng of forming a right opportunistic clique. Peng Dehuai was summarily removed from his position of Minister of Defence. Now, this seems a bit rash on Mao's part, But in truth, there was a little bit of backstory to the tensions between Mao and Peng that may have contributed to the harsh treatment of the marshal. 
Though the two reportedly had a mutual respect for one another, Peng had openly defied Mao in the past, on one occasion travelling all the way back from the front lines of the Korean War just to argue about orders that he had received from the chairman face to face. In a bit more ancient history, it was apparently under Peng's own command that Mao Zedong's son had been shot and killed during the Korean War, though personal grievances were probably just minor factors in this case. More recently, it seems that Mao had also suspected that there was some political manoeuvring going on behind his back. He had recently promoted another marshal, Lin Biao, to a higher position than Peng, which he felt may have been perceived as a slight, leading Peng to ally himself with other people within the party who wanted to oust Mao from direct control and seize power from themselves. To top it all off, Peng had just come back from a visit to the Soviet Union, where he had reportedly aired his concerns about the Great Leap to Khrushchev, causing the Soviet leader to pull out of a highly anticipated nuclear deal with China at the last minute. This seems to have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Poor Peng, no one dared come to his defence, as all his senior colleagues were cowed into following the chairman's version of events. So much for stepping down and taking a back seat and running the country. Now, any criticism of an idea of Mao's was equated to a criticism of Mao in general. The most obvious consequence of the launching of the anti-rightist campaign at Lushan, yes, there was another anti-rightist campaign, was the start of the second leap. All opposition to the leap was swept away, and all the critical analysis of the previous months was for some reason thrown straight into the trash, along with all notions of moderation and balance and anything else that the planners group had come up with. The spring of 1960 saw a complete renewal of all Great Leap strategies and a resurgence in the formation of communes, which ultimately led to the disastrous harvest of that year and the famine that continued to grip the country until 1962. So, that concludes a sort of introduction to the Great Leap and explains how the planning and implementation of the Great Leap Forward policies took place. So in the next episode, we'll be covering the Great Leap at the grassroots. Namely, what did the Great Leap Forward policies actually look like when implemented? How were different sections of society, men, women, children and old people, affected by these policies? How did life change for the people of China as a result of the leap? And were all of the changes for the worst? We'll be covering these questions and more next time. For now... Don't forget that you can subscribe to the Sinobabble newsletter over at Substack, and if you wish to support the podcast, you can make a donation by going over to sinobabble.com and clicking the donate button. You can make a one-off donation, or you can sign up for a monthly subscription. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and I hope you tune in next time.